For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. From the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska, this is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. The U.S. military defines a broken arrow as an unexpected event involving nuclear weapons that result in the accidental launching, firing, detonating, theft, or loss of the weapon. The first Broken Arrow event occurred in 1950 during a mission from Eielson Air Force Base near Fairbanks, Alaska. Questions still surround this event and the mystery of what happened to the B-36 aircraft and the Mark IV atomic bomb it carried. Welcome to Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Robin Bearfield, and I'm broadcasting to you from the heart of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge on Kodiak Island in Alaska. In 1949, the Soviet Union detonated its first atomic device, and U.S. air crews soon began practicing in case they were ever called upon to bomb the Soviet Union with a nuclear weapon. In February 1950, the Air Force conducted a mission to determine if a B-36 operating in Arctic conditions could attack the Soviet Union. For example, if the pilot shut down the plane engine while it was being serviced on the ground, could he restart it? In February 1950, an Arctic air mass over the interior of Alaska drove temperatures to 50 degrees below zero. Ice fog reduced visibility to nearly zero, and ground crews at Eielson Air Force Base fought to keep airplanes operational in the extreme weather conditions. This harsh weather provided the perfect opportunity for the U.S. Air Force to conduct a cold-weather training mission for its long-range strategic bombers and crews. The mission called for a squadron of newly released B-36 bombers from Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas, to deploy to Eielson Air Force Base for refueling and servicing. Assigned combat crews would then board the bombers. Each B-36 in the exercise received orders to conduct a simulated nuclear attack on a U.S. city. All the bombers carried Mark IV Fat Man atomic bombs, similar to the bomb dropped on Nagasaki, Japan in 1945. Strategic Air Command officials later stated that the plutonium core for each bomb had been removed for the training mission. A replacement core, similar in weight to the plutonium core, was instead added to the bombs. Even though the plutonium core had been removed, each bomb was still armed with several thousand pounds of explosives and a small amount of unenriched uranium. However, without the plutonium core, the bomb was not a functional nuclear weapon. The B-36 was a huge plane with a 230-foot wingspan and six Pratt & Whitney piston engines mounted behind the wings. It was a long-range intercontinental bomber capable of flying 6,000 miles while carrying 10,000 pounds of payload. Over reduced range, it could carry as much as 86,000 pounds. But how would it function in Arctic conditions? The B-36 had only been in production for a few years, and its Arctic capabilities remained untested. 
the first crews from the 436th Bomb Squadron at Carswell Air Force Base began arriving at Isleson in early February. The B-36 bombers were scheduled to arrive a few days later, but the extreme cold and ice fog delayed them for a week. The first bombers finally touched down at Isleson on February 11th. The second contingent of three bombers arrived on February 13th. On February 13th, while the second group of bombers were serviced and refueled, the combat crews received their last briefings. Captain Harold Berry piloted the second bomber in the group of three, Aircraft 2075, and a crew of 16 men accompanied him. Their mission was to fly at 12,000 feet from Isleson Air Force Base to Seattle. Then they would climb to an altitude of 40,000 feet and head to Montana, before changing course again to head to their designated strike target of San Francisco. After their simulated bomb drop, they would return to Carswell Air Force Base in Texas. The planned mission would cover 6,000 miles and last 16 hours. The flight plan did not include any penetration of Canadian airspace. The weather at Isleson Air Force Base on February 13 consisted of ice fog and reduced visibility to several hundred feet. However, above the fog, blue skies persisted from Fairbanks to Anchorage. The weather was expected to rapidly deteriorate between Anchorage and Seattle, with a solid overcast between 1,000 and 15,000 feet. Meteorologists predicted heavy turbulence below 14,000 feet and possible heavy icing up to 15,000 feet. Although the weather briefer recommended flying above 17,000 feet, the task force commander decided not to alter the mission and ordered the pilots of the three bombers to fly to Seattle at their assigned altitude of 12,000 feet. They could fly above the clouds only if they encountered heavy icing conditions. Bomber 2075, piloted by Captain Harold Berry, departed Isleson Air Force Base at 11.27 a.m. The mission proceeded under good conditions for a few hours until the plane flew into the expected low-pressure area and clouds. As the B-36 neared the border of Canada, south of Annette Island, the bomber encountered ice and its airspeed began to slow. The crew assumed that ice was building up on the propellers, and the flight engineer quickly adjusted the propeller settings. At the same time, Captain Barry increased engine power to try to reach an altitude above the clouds. The B-36 slowly climbed for several minutes, but then the number one engine on the left wing indicated a high fuel flow. The flight engineer leaned the fuel mixture, and the problem was resolved briefly. Soon, however, all six engines began doing the same thing, with each propeller spinning uncontrollably. The pilot could only maintain altitude with full emergency power. A few minutes later, the left side gunner seated behind the left wing reported a fire in the number one engine. He could see flames shooting around the edge of the engine cowling. The captain immediately shut down the engine but he knew that with maximum power applied, the other engines would also soon catch on fire. He decreased the power to the remaining five engines, but with reduced power, the B-36 could not maintain its altitude and began a slow descent. A few moments later, the number two engine began to spit flames, and Captain Barry had to shut it down. Less than two minutes later, the number five engine on the right wing burst into flames. The plane now had only three functional engines, and it was only a matter of time before they also caught on fire. The B-36 began descending at more than 500 feet per minute, and Captain Barry knew he and his crew would have to abandon the crippled plane. First, however, there was the matter of the Fat Man atomic bomb. The crew knew they must detonate the bomb to protect U.S. nuclear secrets. In 
In secret testimony to the U.S. Air Force Board of Inquiry into the loss of the B-36, Captain Barry described the final minutes of the flight. We were losing altitude quite rapidly, in excess of 500 feet a minute, and I asked the radar operator to give me a heading to take me out over the water. We kept our rapid rate of descent, and we got out over the water just about 9,000 feet, and the co-pilot hit the salvo switch, and at first nothing happened, so he hit it again, and this time it opened. The radar operator gave me a heading to take me back over land. The engineer gave me emergency power to try to hold our altitude. We still descended quite rapidly, and by the time we got over land, we were at 5,000 feet, so I rang the alarm bell and told them to leave. According to the pilot and crew, the Mark IV bomb was safely detonated with conventional explosives 3,000 feet over the North Pacific Ocean. Then, Barry piloted the plane toward Princess Royal Island, Canada, and ordered his crew to don their parachutes and jump from the damaged aircraft. After most of the crew had jumped from the B-36, Captain Barry activated the autopilot to steer the plane in a southwest direction over the ocean. Barry later said only one other crewman remained on board when he jumped. Captain Thomas Schreier, the flight's atomic weaponeer, was adjusting his parachute. Barry said he looked at Schreier, and Schreier nodded and motioned that he would follow Barry out of the plane. Schreier was never seen again, and his fate remains one of the many mysteries surrounding this flight. Due to windy conditions, the crew of Flight 2075 landed over several miles in the heavily forested terrain of Princess Royal Island. An immediate combined rescue effort involving U.S. and Canadian military and 40 aircraft scoured the coastline of Princess Royal Island and recovered 12 of the 17 crewmen from Flight 2075, including one man dangling upside down in a parachute from a tree with a broken ankle. Searchers hiked through the brush on Princess Royal Island looking for any trace of the five missing men while ships and planes scanned the ocean for signs of the men or the downed aircraft. On February 22nd, searchers found a one-man life raft near Princess Royal Island, but it looked unused. Four of the five missing crewmen were the first four to exit the bomber, and analysts believed they had probably landed in the ocean west of Princess Royal Island. None of the men were dressed for a water landing and lacked adequate survival gear. If they survived the jump from the B-36, they probably quickly succumbed to the frigid ocean. Since Captain Schreier was the last man to jump from the plane, perhaps he landed in the water on the other side of Princess Royal Island and suffered the same fate as the first four men. But did Captain Thomas Schreier ever jump from the plane? Let me take a short break. As I have mentioned many times, I'm an author. I've written five novels, and my sixth one will be out in a few months. I have also written a wildlife book and a true crime book containing many of the stories you've heard on this podcast. My books are available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other online bookstores. If you would like an autographed copy of one of my books, you can order one from my publisher at publicationconsultants.com. Be sure to mark the box requesting an autographed copy and write what you would like the autograph to say or who it is for in the text box. You can find the link to Publication Consultants in the show notes for this episode. While the search continued for the missing men, the surviving crew members were whisked back to the United States and debriefed. The loss of a nuclear weapon was a serious, top-secret matter, and the Air Force wanted to ensure they obtained a clear, accurate picture of what had happened on Flight 2075. 
all of the crewmen supported Captain Barry's story and said they had safely jettisoned and destroyed the atomic weapon before abandoning the aircraft. The search for the missing B-36 covered more than 25,000 square miles by aircraft and ships. When no sign of the missing bomber or its nuclear bomb was discovered, officials felt confident that the plane and the bomb had ended up at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean and would never be found. The search slowed and finally ended. The U.S. Air Force Special Investigation Board met three days after the accident. Their findings were classified as top secret and were not released for a decade. The board did not blame the crew of Flight 2075, and a review of the bomber's maintenance records found no prior issues with the engines to explain their traumatic malfunctions. Other B-36 bombers had suffered problems with their exhaust systems, and experts initially blamed these issues on the plane's design. The engines on the B-36 were mounted behind instead of in front of the wing, preventing adequate cooling of the engines. However, after further analysis, the experts noted that the engine fires only occurred under severe icing conditions, suggesting the icing on the carburetors had caused them. Captain Barry told investigators that once his men had jumped from the B-36, he set the autopilot for a course out over the North Pacific. Those involved in the investigation into the incident believed the plane had gone down in the ocean and would never be found. Curiously, Barry also reportedly said he saw the bomber turn soon after he bailed out. In September 1953, three years after the search for the missing B-36 bomber had concluded, a Royal Canadian Air Force flight searching for the missing de Havilland Dove aircraft of Ellis Hall, a Texas millionaire oilman, spotted the wreckage of aircraft B-36 Flight 2075. The nearly intact bomber rested on Mount Colaget approximately 50 miles east of the border between Alaska and Canada. It was on the east side of the remote Nass Basin, northwest of Hazleton, British Columbia. How had the bomber crashed 240 miles north of its last position and 3,000 feet higher than it was flying when the crew bailed out? During those last crucial moments before the crew jumped, the plane was dropping in altitude at 500 feet per minute. Captain Barry testified that he set the autopilot on a southwest heading out over the Pacific before he jumped. How did the plane gain altitude and fly in the opposite direction from its set course? Even more mysterious, how did the aircraft fly inland for an hour through mountain peaks as high as 9,000 feet? Since the bomber crashed in the opposite direction from which it should have been flying, could the U.S. Air Force and the Canadian government believe the testimony of Captain Barry and the crew of Flight 2075? Had they actually dropped the nuclear device into the ocean? Or... Was it in the wreckage? Unfortunately, Captain Barry was killed in another B-36 during a mid-air collision a year after he'd bailed out of the doomed B-36 over Princess Royal Island, so he could no longer answer questions about Flight 2075. What would he have said when he learned the plane changed course and climbed 3,000 feet before crashing into Mount Colaget? The mystery surrounding Flight 2075 centered around Captain Schreier, the weaponeer and pilot who was the last known crew member aboard the flight. Did Schreier take the plane off autopilot and steer it inland through the mountain passes of British Columbia? And if so, why? Was he trying to pilot the plane back to Alaska? Why would he take such a chance, many wondered, unless the bomb was still on board and he wanted to get the precious cargo back to Eielson Air Force Base intact? 
After the discovery of the wreckage, the U.S. Air Force sent a ground recovery team to the site of the crash, but weather conditions forced the team to abandon its climb. Another group tried to reach the area in late October, but it also turned around after encountering heavy snowfall and steep icy slopes. In 1954, a joint U.S. Air Force and Canadian team reached the site by helicopter, where they analyzed the wreckage, salvaged top-secret electronic equipment, and rigged and detonated most of the rest of the plane with explosives. The mission was classified, and neither the Canadian nor U.S. governments released the coordinates for the wreckage site. A rumor persisted that the search team had found a body in the wreckage, and the denial by U.S. Air Force personnel did little to quash it. Were Captain Schreier's remains found with the downed aircraft? In 1956, a group from the Geological Survey of Canada accidentally happened upon the crash site while conducting a geological survey. They found a Geiger counter in the wreckage and unexploded pieces of ordnance, but they did not know the importance of the downed aircraft and did not publicize their find. However, they also did not forget about the crash and the ominous presence of the Geiger counter. Forty years after discovering the wreckage, one of the members of the 1956 survey team told a Canadian environmental group about the crash site and his concerns that it could contain radioactive material. This survey team member learned more about the crashed airplane and its secret payload through the Freedom of Information Act. Rumors flew. Had the bomb gone down with the B-36? And did the bomb contain the actual plutonium core? In August 1997, the Canadian Department of National Defense and Environmental Protection sent another expedition to the crash site to conduct a radiological survey of the wreckage and the surrounding area to determine if there was any radioactive contamination in and near the wreckage. They found no radioactivity at the site, nor signs indicating the bomb went down with the plane. In 2003, John Clearwater, a Canadian expert on nuclear weapons, led a team to the crash site, and they found something interesting. While the crash and the original demolition team had destroyed most of the equipment in the bomb bay, the bomb shackle that had held the bomb in place remained intact and in good shape. Clearwater concluded that since the shackle was in such good condition, there would be some evidence of the bomb in the wreckage if it had been in the plane when it crashed. While there is still some controversy about whether the bomb was in the plane and if the bomb was armed, most experts agreed that the plutonium core was not in the bomb, and the bomb was detonated with conventional explosives above the North Pacific. The big remaining question is how did the B-36 end up on Mount Colaget at an altitude 3,000 feet higher than it was flying when the crew abandoned it? Two theories have circulated about how the plane ended up in its final spot. One theory suggests that after the crew left the plane, the ice broke off the wings, allowing the B-36 to gain altitude, and an autopilot error caused the change of direction. According to the second theory, Captain Schreier remained on board the plane and flew it inland through the mountains until it crashed on Mount Colaget. The U.S. government still has not released all the documents relating to the fate of Flight 2075. Once they finally disclose these documents, perhaps the rumors surrounding the B-36 and the Mark IV bomb it was carrying when it left Eielson Air Force Base, can finally be put to rest. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you to my patrons for your support. 
Check out the show notes for more information on how you can support this podcast and unlock extra episodes by joining the Last Frontier Club. If you haven't already done it, be sure to join the Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier Facebook group and chat about the podcast. I'll see you soon for the next episode of Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Grainger.com, or just stop by. Granger, For the ones who get it done.